labor for itself in the face of capitalist determination for itself. It is the historical material problem of self-determination. From these all too brief remarks, I derive two conclusions, that is, two tasks in, in regard to the communist uh, hypothesis, which in the end might bring us together in the United Front, and which by this argument for the subtraction from party and the state no longer ought to exclude that we take seriously the proposal of someone like that gentleman. The first task has to consist in historicizing the communist hypothesis. This is at once the beauty and the simplicity of the idea, first proposed by Badu and by Messin of ideology, that communism is defined on one hand by a series of axiomatic invariants that can be found whenever a mass mobilization directly confronts the privileges of property, hierarchy, and authority. And on the other hand, by the specific political actor who historically and with varying degrees of success or counter-finality actualize and implement those same communist invariants. In other words, our first task amounts to writing, as it were, a history of communist eternity in a counterfactually or Keynesian sense. The key concept in this regard is not the orthodox one of stages in a dialectical periodization, but that of the sequences of the communist hypothesis in a strictly imminent determination. Unless the communist hypothesis is left to shine <coughs> with all the intempestive brilliance of a platonic or Kantian relative idea, however, communism must also be actualized and organized as the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. In other words, communism must again find inscription in the concrete body or flesh of a political subject, even if such an act of subjectivization no longer passes through the traditional form of the party for its environment. As Badu writes in Up an Obscure Disaster, the point where an instant of thought subtracts itself from the state, inscribing this subtraction into being, constitutes the real of a policy. And a political organization has no other goal than to hold on to the game set, tenir the pagagne, an illusion to Rambo's season in hell, that is to provide a body for that thought which collectively remembered has been able to find the public gesture of the insubordination that comes. But of course, this is also precisely where the cause of all the major disagreements can be found, including among participants in our conference. I will skip the uh, part where I try, based on Garcia de Neves' reading of the, the notion of the party, in which he tries to develop what he calls a dialectic between the ephemeral sense of the party and the various uh, instances that can take versus what Marx himself calls the general sense of the party, or the grand historical sense of the party. He quotes a letter from 1860 uh, in which Marx uh, surprisingly says that after the dissolution of the, Com the League of Communists in 1862, he actually never belonged, and at that time doesn't belong to any public or secret organization, because he has the party in that grand historical sense so Linnea argues for a return to this grand historical sense of the party that might be instantiated in, in various uh, uh, forms of more ephemeral organizations. And I think this is not incompatible with some of the lesser known passages in Badu's work where he also argues for the party as a flexible form of uh, organization. Finally, with regard to the uh, question of communism and the state, in a recent interview, after having occupied the post of second in command of his country's state apparatus, Garcia Dinera even goes so far as to suggest the possibility that the state, provided it is subjected to a new constituent power, might be one of the embodiments that potentialize the communist government. <laughs> the claim otherwise, of course, would have been inconsistent on the part of a vice president. Even so, I find his work, as usual, both eloquent and provocative, uh, which is why I will quote him at length in the final quote. The general horizon of the era is coming, and this communism will have to be constructed on the basis of society's self-organizing capacity, of processes of generation and distribution of communitarian, self-managing wealth. Think what Michael was calling the production of the common. But at this moment it is clear that this is not an immediate horizon which centers on the conquest of equality, 
the redistribution of wealth, the broadening of life. Equality is fundamental because it breaks a chain of five centuries of structural inequality. That is, the, that is the aim at the time, as far as social forces allow us to go, not because we prescribe it in that way, because that is, but because that is what we see. Rather, we enter the movement with expecting and desiring eyes placed upon the communist horizon. But we are serious and objective in the social sense of the term by signaling the limits of the movement. And that's where the fight came with various compañeros about what it was possible to do. When I enter into the government, what I do is to validate and begin to operate at the level of the state in function of this reading of the current moment. So then, what about communism? What can be done from the state in function of this communist horizon? To support as much as possible the unfolding of society's autonomous organizational <coughs> capacity. This is as far as the possibility can go in terms of what a leftist state, a revolutionary state, can do. To broaden the workers' base and the autonomy of the workers' world, to potentialize, potential, forms of communitarian economy, economy wherever there are more communitarian networks, articulations, and such. As for those of us with ADD, or simply a shorter attention span, would dream of having no dealings with any state apparatus whatsoever, perhaps the first and original task must be to abandon all images that would mock the history of communism, of communism upon the life of an individual, from birth to infanthood, to puberty, to senility and death. All such imagery ultimately may well seem to be a historicization of communism in terms of its ages, but unlike a proper sequential communication, this actually confirms the tacit assumption that communism is barely a passing episode within capitalism, which by contrast appears to be immortal, or in a vulgarization of the same argument, more adapted to human nature. One of Marx's most extinct definitions, definitions of the ideological work of communists, however, <coughs> comes by way of a quote from Jean-Jacques Rousseau at the end of On the Jewish Question. Whoever dares undertake to establish a people's institution must feel himself capable of changing, as it were, human nature. Changing human nature. The egotistic individualism of human nature, which unfortunately cast its shadow even over Lenin's rhetoric in his pamphlet against the childhood disease of Western communism, is then the first thing that needs to be destroyed as part of the practice of communism, not as an ideal to come, but as the destruction of the current state of effect.